Another Oscar ceremony is in the books, and I've got the highs, lows, and everything in between right now. Hello everybody, I'm Dan Merle here with my recap of last night's Academy Awards ceremony. As of now, as of the time I'm taping this, we still don't quite know what the ratings were, if ratings were able to tick up from Oppenheimer and Barbie being nominated. But if more people were watching, I hope that they liked what they saw. As expected, it was a big night for Oppenheimer, which rolled to several big wins. It led all movies with seven Academy Awards. That ties it with films like last year's Everything Everywhere All at Once, Schindler's List, Patton, All About Eve, Gravity, and The Sting, among others. Poor Things had the second most wins, with four, including Best Actress and three technical awards. And The Zone of Interest won two Oscars for Best International Feature and Best Sound. But only those three films won more than one Academy Award. And overall, the Oscars spread the love to 10 different feature-length films in addition to the short films. As far as multi-nominated movies that didn't win anything, Maestro went 0 for 7, and Killers of the Flower Moon went 0 for 10. That's one off the all-time record of Oscar nominations without a win, which is 11. Two movies currently share that record, including Steven Spielberg's The Color Purple. And the interesting thing about Scorsese's recent films is that Kills to the Flower Moon went 0 for 10. Four years ago, back in 2020, The Irishman also went 0 for 10. And then going backwards in his filmography, Silence went 0 for 1, and The Wolf of Wall Street went 0 for 5, which means that Martin Scorsese's movies have gone 0 for 26 since the last win, which was back in 2012 when Hugo won several Academy Awards. So those are some basic Oscar stats. Let's talk about the show itself. Jimmy Kimmel returned to host, and I've actually liked his hosting jobs in previous years. He's more of an MC. He doesn't do a whole lot of elaborate bits. This year was not my favorite of his performances. I just don't think that his material was particularly good. The opening monologue felt obligatory, if anything, but it did have a few sharp jabs, especially when he brought up the fact that Greta Gerwig wasn't nominated for Best Director and that she should have been and everybody started clapping. And he pointed out, rightfully so, that the people supporting what he said were also the ones who didn't nominate her for Best Director. I know you're clapping, but you're the ones who didn't vote for her, by the way. <laughs> don't act like you had nothing to do with this. I also like the moment where he brought the show's crew out on stage. In case you don't know, IATSE, which is the union that governs most of the technical roles in Hollywood, is currently undergoing their own contract negotiations. And if they can't come to terms, then we could be looking at another frankly disastrous work stoppage in Hollywood. So hopefully that union solidarity stays strong and the people backstage will continue to get that support from the people in front of the camera. So Kimmel did a few things I liked. I thought that a lot of his jokes were average. Some of them were okay. But there was one thing he did that I really didn't like, which was a joke he made at the expense of Robert Downey Jr. in reference to his previous drug problems. This is the highest point of Robert Downey Jr.'s long and illustrious career. Well, one of the highest points, Robert has been a, was that two on the nose or is that a drug motion you made? And listen, I'm not clutching my pearls on behalf of Robert Downey Jr. here. Oftentimes, these jokes are cleared ahead of time so that they know to have the camera in place. So it's very likely, and I've heard reports even perhaps confirming this, that he knew that this joke was going to be made and that he okayed it. But he really shouldn't have been put in that position because I just don't understand why Jimmy Kimmel as a comedian even needs to go there. This is a huge moment in Robert Downey Jr.'s life and a huge moment in his career. He rebuilt that career brick by brick, helped to build the MCU through sheer charisma, and has been so open and seemingly honest about his process of recovery and his own flaws. Why do you even need to revisit that at this point? It's not like nobody's ever made a Robert Downey Jr. drug joke before. Why do you need to even open that box? I, I just don't understand, and it really didn't sit well with me. And honestly, given what we saw last night, can we just have John Mulaney come on and host the Academy Awards? He had one of the better presenter bits where he just talked about what he liked about Field of Dreams or really just sort of recapped the plot, which I thought was really funny in an absurdist kind of way. Because I guess there's a rule in ghost baseball that if you leave the field at any point to become an elderly ghost and do the Heimlich maneuver, you can't return to the field. He also hosted the honorary Oscars that happened before the ceremony this year. You can actually find his material on YouTube. And I thought that he was really funny, really fresh. I like his sensibilities. Why doesn't he just host the Academy Awards? Get some new blood in there because it just didn't seem like Jimmy Kimmel was feeling it this year. He kind of seemed like he was phoning it in because he's done it so many times. If he's losing interest, 
bring in somebody else. And when we look at the production of the show overall, I think that there were some odd decisions. Every 10 years or so, the Academy tries out this experiment where instead of running clips of the nominated performances, they bring out five different people to talk to each nominee and say why they're so great. And it's usually past winners. And sometimes that will generate some kind of cool moments. We had a few of those last night. For example, I like the fact that Rita Moreno, who did the song America and West Side Story, was handling the introduction of America Ferrera. America. I liked that Sam Rockwell dropped a very welcome Tropic Thunder reference when he was introducing Robert Downey Jr. There are actors, and then there are actors who don't drop character until the DVD commentary. And I liked Nick Cage going full Nick Cage when he talked about Paul Giamatti wearing a soft contact lens to get the lazy eye effect in the holdovers. Would I have done that? Hell yes. But the point is, you did do it, Paul. But what those moments all seem to have in common is that it seemed like those presenters had some sort of a personal connection with those particular nominees, but that wasn't the case all the time. Sometimes you could tell they were obviously reading off a teleprompter. It didn't really seem that heartfelt. It seemed a bit awkward at moments, like they never even really met each other. And it does really slow the show down, in addition to not providing any time to show actual clips of the work that's been nominated. I know that there are a lot of people that are fans of this, of bringing somebody out to talk to each nominee individual and honestly if you freed it from the constraints of having it be past winners and brought somebody who had a personal connection to each nominee then maybe it'd work better but under this current system I really think it's an idea that should go away because it's just not executed properly and I think that the bad or the weird or the awkward outweighs the good. Maybe I'm in the minority on this but that's how I felt watching last night. And then there was one other thing and this should be something that's just it should just be a gimme because it's a very simple concept, the in memoriam segment. And somehow these award shows keep messing this up. They keep trying to reinvent the wheel of what to do with in memoriam. And so last night they were projecting the names and pictures of everybody on just about every background element that you could find, but keeping the dancers and singers and musicians in the foreground. That's not what this is all about. That's not what the intention is. If you want to have a live performance, that's fine. Do what the Baptists did. They had Hannah Waddingham sing a beautiful song to do the In Memoriam segment, but they would cut to her for 10 or 15 seconds, and then they would resume full screen on camera the run of people that they were remembering. That's the way to do it, but I shouldn't be looking ahead or looking forward to my screen going like, what? Where is it? Oh, it's over there now? Oh, it's over on the sides? Why is it all the way back there? Why is that dancer blocking somebody's name? This is a very simple concept and an easy concept that shouldn't be that hard to figure out. You roll the names of the people that were lost over the last year so that we can remember the ones that we loved and then gripe about the ones that they left off. It's a tale as old as time and yet they just can't get it right. I don't understand it. One positive change that they did make, and I want to give them some credit there, is it was obvious that they talked to the winners about not reading off of a piece of paper and not just going into a litany of agents and publicists, etc. when they're giving their acceptance speeches. That was part of my own personal thing when I gave my tips on how I would fix the Oscars. So I'm going to give them credit for that. And it largely worked. Even people that brought papers up there weren't doing the same old acceptance speech and they did feel more genuine and heartfelt. So that was a good thing about the show. And let's get to some of those winners. The first win of the night went to Davine Joy Randolph as expected with help getting to the stage from her co-star Paul Giamatti. That's great to see. She was crying. He was crying. Everybody was crying. It was a moment of genuine emotion in celebration of one of the year's great performances that I think really got the night off to a great start as far as the awards go. For so long, I've always wanted to be different. And now I realize I just need to be myself. Best Supporting Actor went as expected to Robert Downey Jr. It was basically a coronation at this point. His speeches have been very self-effacing this award season, and this one was no different. I'd like to thank my terrible childhood and the Academy in that order. It didn't deliver a capital M moment like some people might have expected, but what a culmination this night must have been from 30 years ago when he was nominated for Chaplin to today as he wins his first Academy Award. I'm a fan of his work and I'm a fan of his outlook on life. He just seems like somebody who has a very healthy sense of self and has gone through what a lot of people couldn't even imagine going through and come out a better person 
on the other side. I do think it'll be interesting, however, as time goes on for the context of the ceremony to get lost when people are watching his acceptance speech on YouTube and wonder why they cut to an applauding dog right after he walks off stage with his Academy Award. That's the dog from Anatomy of a Fall, by the way. I mean, I've seen Anatomy of a Fall and that still caught me by surprise. So yeah, a lot of YouTube comment sections in five or six years are definitely gonna be full of, why is there a dog there? Best Actor also wasn't a big surprise. Killian Murphy's recent wins put him squarely in the favorite slot going into tonight, and I was happy to see his work recognized after so many years of solid work where he's probably not even the first name you think of in all of the different movies that he's in. I think it's a great judgment on his past work, but more so, of course, a recognition of his work in Oppenheimer. This movie would not have worked without him, and as much as I love Paul Giamatti's performance, if I were an Oscar voter, I would have voted for Giamatti. That is not to take any anything away from Killian Murphy, who was fantastic in Oppenheimer, and I was very happy to see him win that Academy Award. For better or for worse, we're all living in Oppenheimer's world, so I would really like to dedicate this to the peacemakers everywhere. And then we have the Best Actress race, which I've been saying for a while was a coin toss. I literally had no idea whose name they were going to read out when they opened that envelope. And it looked like Emma Stone didn't either because she seemed genuinely surprised to win her second Academy Award for Poor Things. Oh boy, this is really, this is really overwhelming. Sorry, I, mm, okay. And my voice is also a little gone, whatever. This race was so close and both performances were so good, but I've already seen this narrative emerging, some of it on social media, some of it from the clickbait articles because they've got to drive people to click on their sites, saying that Lily Gladstone was robbed of an Academy Award, that it's criminal that she didn't win this Oscar. And from my point of view, I definitely think it would have been great to see her win that Oscar, but it's hard for me to look at Emma Stone's win and say that it was criminal or that Lily Gladstone was robbed because they both put in really, really strong performances. And I don't think that should get lost in the mix here. This was such a competitive award season the entire way through for both of them. And it may have just come down to the fact that Emma Stone was front and center for the vast majority of poor things, whereas Killers of the Flower Moon was a sprawling epic and Lily Gladstone was in less of that movie. That doesn't make it a lesser performance. It is a deep performance. It is a soulful performance. It is full of pain and anguish and it's so well done. But some voters may have given the nod to Emma Stone because she was more the focus of her own movie. Who knows why Oscar voters vote the way that they do. There are lots of talented people working. There are always great performances that are nominated. And unless there's a tie, only one of those performances can win. I don't think that we should diminish the achievement that Emma Stone has because Lily Gladstone wasn't able to get it this time. And I think the most important takeaway is to keep an eye on the industry and make sure that Lily Gladstone gets more opportunities to come back and win this Academy Award. I don't want this to be the last time that we see Lily Gladstone at the Academy Awards because she proved this past year that she is more than worthy of being at that ceremony and winning an Oscar. Now, obviously this show took place against the backdrop of instability around the world, and that took center stage in a couple of the speeches. One of them was from Best Documentary winner, Mstislav Chernov, who was accepting for 20 Days in Mariupol, his frontline documentary taking place in the early days of Russia's invasion, and his grief and anger about what was happening to his country was palpable. It was a very powerful speech. I wish I would never made this film. We can make sure that the history record is set straight and that the truth will prevail. War also took center stage in director Jonathan Glazer's speech, accepting for the zone of interest win in the best international film category. All the victims of this dehumanization, how do we resist? And listen, this is all heavy stuff, but film often takes place against the backdrop of very consequential world events. And I think it would have been weird if either of these two filmmakers had gone on stage and accepted without referring to the very things that their films were about. And the reason I know it would have been weird if they would have done that is because the winners for the best animated short film, which is called War Is Over, did accept the award for their film without even mentioning war or the concept of war or ending war, even in passing. And you know, I've been upfront on my feelings about War Is Over in both the video where I picked the Oscars and where I reviewed every Oscar movie. 
in a lot of ways, it was my least favorite of the nominated shorts because I thought it was very shallow. And I thought they went for an easy message that ultimately didn't amount to much or didn't amount to anything. It was meant as a cheap sentimental tug on the heartstrings. And the reason that I probably, against my better judgment, didn't pick it to win the Academy Award is because I thought that the Academy voters would see through what I think was the cynical approach that this short film took. But it looked like the voters were more willing to embrace the hollowness of that film over the more challenging topics of some of the other nominees. And make no mistake, War Is Over was an inside job based on music from one of the friggin' Beatles and backed by Peter Jackson and Weta. And if you saw the movie and you liked it or it spoke to you, then, you know, we just disagree and maybe I'm just a lot more cynical about the film than a lot of other people. But it just seemed like such a try-hard cheap shot to try to get an Oscar. And I think the reason I'm so pressed about it winning is that obviously it worked. And I guess the reason that I'm doubly upset about it is that even in Victory, the filmmakers behind this film seemed completely uninterested in addressing the theme of their movie, the entirety of what it's about, and were much more interested in wishing Yoko Ono a happy Mother's Day. So could everyone please say happy Mother's Day, Yoko? Happy Mother's Day, Yoko! I don't know. It just bothered me. If you're going to make a movie called War Is Over, and there are numerous wars destructive conflicts happening currently around the world, and you don't even pay that lip service, it already makes what I thought was a pretty cynical act of filmmaking seem that much more cynical. And much like Jimmy Kimmel's jokes about Robert Downey Jr., it rubbed me the wrong way. However, I will say, while we're on the subject of the shorts category, that I was very happy to see the winner of the best documentary short was a movie called The Last Repair Shop, which by the way is free right now on YouTube. You can just search The Last Repair Shop and it should be the first thing that pops up. It is absolutely worth your time. It's about 40 minutes. Skip that episode of whatever you're gonna watch on Netflix and watch this one instead. It's about employees in the LA public school system who repair the instruments that are provided to kids so that they can have a music education. And it was so great to see it win. I love the acceptance speech. I love that they brought one of the kids up on stage. The Last Repair Shop winning redeemed the Oscar voters in my eyes a little bit for giving the Oscar to War Is Over, but I'm gonna have to really work hard to get over that one. Music education isn't just about creating uh, incredible musicians, it's about creating incredible humans. There's a lot more of the Oscars to break down, but before we do, I wanna thank the sponsor for this video. This video is brought to you by Rocket Money. Did you know that nearly 75% of people out there have subscriptions that they've completely forgotten about? It happened to me. I had a subscription that I thought I'd canceled years ago, but it turns out it had been draining 10 bucks a month out of my account for so long until I started using Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills so that you can grow your savings. When I open Rocket Money, it lists all of my recurring fees and subscriptions, and even even asks me if I want to track new ones so I can look at all my month's expenses right there on the dashboard, including how much I'm spending this month compared to last month. And if I see something I don't want anymore, Rocket Money can help me cancel that subscription with just a few taps. And I can even create a custom budget every month to help me keep things on track. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members on average $740 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions today by going to rocketmoney.com slash Dan. That's rocketmoney.com slash Dan, rocketmoney.com slash Dan. All right, so that was some of the heavy stuff. Let's talk about some of the lighter moments of the evening. And a lot of the comedy wasn't even provided by Jimmy Kimmel, but by the people that were presenting the awards. Exhibit A would be Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt, who were starring together in The Fall Guy this summer, playing up the whole Barbenheimer feud of 2023. Happy that we can finally uh, put this Barbenheimer rivalry behind us. And the way this award season's turned out wasn't that much of a rivalry, so Ooh. just let it go. Also, after the comedy bit, they introduced this video that was talking about stunt performers and how important they are to the history and the tapestry of film. And I was so convinced that this video was going to culminate in a surprise announcement on the Oscar telecast that next year they're going to start giving an Academy Award out to stunt performers like they're doing with casting directors starting next year. And I was like, what a great idea. You hold back an announcement of a new category for stunt performers, which so many people have wanted for so long, and then you announce it on the air at the Oscars. People are going to go crazy. Social media is going to blow up. But no, it was just a video being like, hey, stunt performers, you know, you're awesome people and good job. Yeah, I don't know. I 
it's kind of a letdown. I mean, I guess it's nice to get that pat on the back, but you know, the Oscar category would have been a lot nicer. Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger also had a twins reunion, but I actually liked their bit comparing notes about the fact that they both faced down and were defeated by Batman. That was funny, but the thing that really kicked it in the stratosphere was when Michael Keaton decided to play along. And let me tell you, I mean, I know that he was in The Flash last year, but that guy still has the Batman face. There he is. I... He's right here. <laughs> He's right here. Look. You have a lot of nerve to show your face oh, yeah, you here. Got, you know. I mentioned John Mulaney and his bit about Field of Dreams, which is really funny, but he also gave us what I think was the only onstage acknowledgement of Madam Webb when he was talking about lines that would never have been caught if not for the sound people of Hollywood. You're going to need a bigger boat. I'll have what she's having. And he was in the Amazon with my mother when she was researching spiders just before she died. There was also a funny bit with Kate McKinnon in America Ferrera where she learns that Jurassic Park isn't a documentary. Kate, the dinosaurs weren't real. Oh, America, not you too. No. And also that she's apparently been sexting Steven Spielberg. To whom have I been sending my tasteful nudes? But it wasn't just the presenters, the nominees and winners themselves also provided a lot of the night's best moments. I love the fact that the zone of interest won in the sound category. The sound work in Oppenheimer, don't get me wrong, was absolutely masterful, but the sound work in the zone of interest was crucial to that movie succeeding. It provided so much of the dread in that film. And so many times, it seems like just about every year, the Academy Award for Best Sound is pretty much given to the loudest movie, to the movie that has the most sound. So for the Oscar voters to understand the critical role that the sound and zone of interest had beyond just the volume was a really encouraging sign that perhaps we'll see a little bit more of a thoughtful process when it comes to picking this winner in the future. The Boy and the Heron, which was the upset pick to beat Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse for Best Animated Feature, also actually pulled off the upset. Also only the second time that a traditionally hand-animated film has won the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature. The other film was also by Hayao Miyazaki. It was Spirited Away, which won the second ever Oscar for Best Animated Film over 20 years ago. If this is Miyazaki's last film, I love that he went on on top, that he was able to get that Academy Award. And I love Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. It was my personal pick to win the award, but I'm also glad to see a movie as beautiful as The Boy and the Heron take the award home. I thought that it was a bit too esoteric and maybe abstract for a lot of voters, but it appears that it won over enough voters to be able to take home that Oscar. It was a great night for Japan because Godzilla Minus One also pulled out the win for best visual effects. While not completely unexpected, it's still very much an underdog story that likely would not have happened had Dune Part Two actually come out last year. I think that it would have won the Oscar for best visual effects, but because it was delayed to this year, that opened the door for Godzilla Minus One. And what a great speech. You could tell that everybody was so happy. And I was happy for the movie itself. It really was an underdog story. And I love that a small visual effects team was able to go up against all these big studios. And when you look at that competition, Godzilla Minus One was up against Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. The MCU is now 0 for 14 in the best visual effects category at the Oscars. It is by far the most nominated franchise without a win. I think the next one down is the Batman franchise with like three nominations. And with these awards for animation and visual effects going to Japanese artists at the Academy Awards, I hope that this puts an even bigger spotlight on the industry in Japan and not only a spotlight for recognition, but also compensation for the animators and effects artists that are over there making some truly great stuff. And to top the excitement of Godzilla Minus One winning, it was the first time a Godzilla movie had been nominated, the first time a Godzilla movie had ever won an Oscar. You also got to hear the Oscar orchestra play the Godzilla theme as the team took the stage. <laughs> And as great as that was, it was actually my second favorite Oscar orchestra moment of the night. My favorite was actually the rendition of 50 Cent's P.I.M.P. that they played as Justine Trier and Arthur Harari walked up to take the Oscar for Best Original Screenplay for Anatomy of a Fall. <laughs> That version of PIMP that you hear in the movie is actually a cover 
from a band called the Bacow Rhythm and Steel Band. And you can find that version on YouTube right now if you're going to do, you know, some home renovations anytime in the future. Just really crank that music up. But all of these fun moments pale in comparison to what I think was easily the highlight of the night as far as energy and fun. And that is, of course, Ryan Gosling's performance of the Oscar nominated song, I'm Just Ken. This is how you perform a nominated song at the Oscars that dares to be fun. I love that the other Kins from the movie, including Kingsley Benadir and Simu Liu came back and took part in the number, even though they weren't necessarily featured. I love the Busley Berkeley homage, the Marilyn Monroe homage, getting Slash out to play guitar, getting the audience involved. This was one of the best performances of a song that I've seen at the Academy Awards in a very long time. Of course, almost immediately after this huge performance that brought the house down, they then gave the actual Academy Award to the much more traditional, serious, and depressing song instead of I'm Just Ken. This is nothing new for the Oscars. This happens all the time. The fun songs get nominated. The slower songs actually win, with a few exceptions. There was so much hype and anticipation around this performance that I was worried it was going to be a bar that nobody could clear, but it was the commitment to the bit that made it. Ryan Gosling was 110% in. The choreography the scale of it, the imagination behind it. They didn't want to do it just to do it. It didn't feel like we don't talk about Bruno a few years ago where they're like, oh, we should put it in the show, but it didn't really come off very well. It was obvious that they approached this as, okay, people are looking forward to this performance. We're going to give them the best version of I'm Just Ken that we can possibly imagine. And it showed. Sure, the song didn't win the Oscar, but I think that this is going to be one of those Oscar moments that people remember for a very long time. And it was such an exciting performance that it completely overshadowed the other performances, including The Fire Inside, which I'm pretty sure is the first onstage performance of a song inspired by a snack. The best original song Oscar for What Was I Made For was Barbie's only Oscar win. And I was actually kind of surprised by that. That. Poor Things had a little chunk in the middle of the show where they ran the best production design, best hair and makeup, and best costume design categories. And in production design and costume design, I thought that one of those two might go to Barbie, especially production design, but it just wasn't in the cards. They really wanted to recognize Poor Things. And so Barbie walks away with just one Oscar, even though it will always be a much bigger part of the film conversation for 2023. As for some miscellaneous categories, I was looking forward to seeing Wes Anderson win his first Oscar for his short film, The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar, which he did, but he was not at the ceremony to accept. So a bit of an Anthony Hopkins situation there and an anticlimax. Still, though, I'm happy that he won. Cord Jefferson was there to accept the Best Adapted Screenplay Award and gave maybe my favorite acceptance speech of the night about the fact that studios try to play it safe by making $200 million movies, but those movies aren't exactly the same safe bets that they used to be, and why not invest that same amount of money in a larger number of untested and untried voices that could be the future of filmmaking? I understand that this is a risk-averse industry, I get it, um, but it, $200 million movies are also a risk. And instead of making one $200 million movie, try making 20 $10 million movies. Or, or... I was also happy that Hoyte Van Hoytema won and advocated for shooting movies on film. To all as aspiring filmmakers out there, I would like to say, Please try shooting uh, that incredible new hip thing called celluloid. And as a cinematographer, Hoyte Van Hoytema actually has a pretty incredible resume. These are just some of the movies that he shot. 2008's Let the Right One In, Tinker Tailor, Soldier Spy, Her, Interstellar, Dunkirk, Tenet, Nope, Ad Astra, and then of course Oppenheimer. It's about time that he gets recognized, and honestly, I think he's been criminally under-nominated over the years. For example, I think that he should have been nominated for his work on Nope. All of these winners led us to the end of the night and two of the biggest awards. One of them, of course, was Best Director, and after years of making epic big screen films and building a very passionate fan base, Christopher Nolan finally took home his first Oscar for Best Director, presented by Steven Spielberg, no less. And given the scale that Nolan is working at and the scale that Spielberg worked at in his prime and the fact that they are both so devoted to the preservation of film and the theatrical experience, the handing off of that Oscar really almost felt like a passing of the torch. Like Spielberg was saying, okay, you're now the custodian of this great legacy of cinema or one of them, and this is your time now. This isn't the end of the road. Show us what you can do because you now occupy this space in the history of film. And it seems like a concept that Nolan himself acknowledged in his speech. We don't know where this incredible journey is going from here, but to know that you think that I'm a meaningful part of it 
means the world to me. Then we had the last award of the night, Best Picture, presented by Al Pacino to celebrate 50 years since The Godfather Part II. And Al Pacino presented this award with what I can only call tipsy uncle giving a speech at your wedding energy. This is the time uh, for the last award of the evening. I love Al Pacino, and I think that he was out there having a good time, which is great. But you have to understand the situation that you're in. Emma Stone just won Best Actress. Now, the last time that we were in this situation, when they opened up the Best Picture envelope, they said the wrong name. So when you are going out there to present Best Picture and you open the envelope, I think you have to say that name with a lot of confidence. Like, you know exactly what that movie is. Instead, Pacino announced the Best Picture winner as if he was, like, taking an eye examination? Like, he wasn't quite sure what the card read? And Maria is C. Oppenheimer. Yes. And I think you could feel that hesitation in the crowd. There was a beat where everybody was just like, okay, but is it Oppenheimer? And then everybody realized that it was, and they went up and they accepted the award. Regardless, Oppenheimer won and becomes the highest grossing movie to win Best Picture since The Return of the King won back in 2004, 20 years ago. And with that, the show wrapped up. Although, I don't know if you saw it, the last image was the dog from Anatomy of a Fall, which is an exceptionally well-trained dog, lifting its leg on Matt Damon's star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. What a great resurrection of that bit from Jimmy Kimmel, maybe his best joke of the night. Overall, I thought that this was a fine show, punctuated by humor that didn't come from Jimmy Kimmel, but came from a lot of the other people that were involved in the show. And I think that really what you're gonna remember are the winners and their speeches. There are a lot of first time winners this year. Christopher Nolan and Emma Thomas, Robert Downey Jr., Davine Joy Randolph, Killian Murphy, Wes Anderson, the United Kingdom, Godzilla, amongst others. So I, I wouldn't necessarily say that it was a bad Oscar show. I just think in some places where they have excelled in the past, particularly regarding the host, it was a little bit of a letdown that was really saved by a very charismatic slate of winners and movies that people seem to actually like. Overall, when you look at my personal Oscar picks, I went 16 for 23, which I guess is an okay number. It's a little bit lower than where I would like to be. By comparison, Gold Derby's predictions were 17 out of 23, and I actually was one up on the predictions that were made from the awards gurus over at THR and Variety. That's not to say, by the way, that I'm any kind of awards expert. I don't think that anybody honestly should call themselves an awards expert. I think that these things are so inherently unpredictable, and you can certainly pay attention to awards season and I cover it here on the channel but you never really know what these voters are going to do and it is sort of unknowable at the end of the day it's just a guess it's sort of like saying you're a fantasy football expert well I can look at the stats and tell you what a player might do or is likely to do but I can never actually tell you what they're going to do out there on the field on Sunday but that unpredictability can be a great thing and me going 16 of 23 in my picks meant that I was surprised by a lot of the winners. I think the other great thing about 10 different movies taking home Oscars is that if you haven't seen any of them, you now have 10 great recommendations for movies to watch. And I would encourage you to watch, especially the ones that won, but there are a lot of great nominees as well. What do you think? Did your favorites win last night? What award were you the most excited about? Let me know down in the comments below and please stay tuned right here on the channel. Of course, I'll have charts with Dan tomorrow to look at the box office of Dune Part 2, perhaps a winner next year, as well as Kung Fu Panda 4 and some of the other movies that opened this past weekend. And of course, I'll still be doing movie reviews and news and all the stuff that we like to do here. Thanks so much for tuning in to this recap of the Academy Awards. Until next time, stay safe and I'll see you then. Bye.